uh, welcome to the SQUID 2023 graduate student panel. Uh, we're all undergraduates, and whether you've been planning to get your PhD since you were in diapers, or you're just about to graduate and you still have zero clue where your career is going to take you, uh, you are in no doubt have a lot of questions about graduate school and how it's going to figure into your eventual career path. So um, that's why we're really happy to bring you this graduate student panel. We're really grateful to our panelists today for being here and sharing their thoughts with us. Um, so first off, to introduce myself, my name is Ben McDonough. Uh, I'm a rising senior at Yale University, a physics major, uh, interested in generally in many body theory and quantum information science. And Michelle? And hello, everybody. My name is Michelle Gelman. I'm an incoming PhD student at USC, um, interested in variational quantum algorithms, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, Harsh, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, hello, I'm Harsh. Um, I am a uh, second, well, I just finished my, finished my second year, so a rising third year graduate student at Yale. Um, I'm co-advised by Shruti Puri and Rob Shokoff. I work on like uh, superconducting qubits, uh, more on the theory side, um, and bosonic codes especially. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to be here today. Thanks for the invite. That's awesome. And sorry to make you do this, but could you add one fun fact about yourself? Oh, uh, fun fact about myself. Uh, I don't know. I feel um, I w accidentally threw my best friend off a jet ski when I was like 15. <laughs> uh, That's pretty fun. No, um, he was a professional swimmer, so he could make it back to shore. Um, and I, yeah, you know, well, I sort of guided him back as well. But yeah. All right. I guess I'll introduce myself next. I'm, I'm Cody. Um, I'm a first year uh, graduate student at UCLA. Um, I do research on quantum transduction um, and uh, silicon color centers. Um, I'm advised by Professor Chi Wei Wang. And I guess a fun fact about myself is that I like to go thrift shopping. Yeah, and I guess I'm blessed. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Amir. I just received my PhD actually two days ago. So I'm um, out of the, the grad school world a little bit. Uh, but my research was focused on many body quantum simulation with superconducting qubits. And my fun fact, I guess this is a random fact, but I used to play volleyball back in high school and college. And I guess, well, and just for fun nowadays. Well, very cool. Uh, yeah. Congratulations, obviously, in your defense. Uh, that's such a huge achievement um, and something that many of us are looking forward to. Uh, yeah, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, so the first question we wanted to ask to, to kick things off. Uh, when I came into undergraduate, I sort of felt like, you know, there was already this expectation that I knew exactly what I want to do, even though I didn't know anything. And, you know, and now that graduate school is, is impending as I have to start applications next year, I feel a lot of pressure to know sort of exactly what I want to uh, study in graduate school. So I, I wanted to ask an open question about, you know, how so these research interests that you just shared, how did you discover that that's what you were interested in? And when you went into grad school, did you pretty much already know that's exactly what you wanted to do? Or when did you find out? Uh, I guess for me, um, like I just knew I wanted to do something related to quantum. I didn't really know what that was. Um, so I just like, you know, I just like literally, I literally just looked up like professors. I was like, OK, you, you do quantum. I'm going to apply to your lab. And then I guess I, I eventually landed on my current advisor. And then even then, like he had a lot of projects. So um, I didn't even know what I wanted to do in his lab. So he just threw me at like four different projects and then the Silicon Color Center one is the one that, that stuck. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess um, for me, I think um, this, um, I feel like maybe a blessing and a curse, um, but I have been working on superconducting qubits since uh, undergrad. Um, so over, like over a summer, I didn't really have anything to do. And so I was just e like cold emailing like every professor in the department being like, hey, can I work with you over the summer? Um, and uh, it just so happened that like I bumped into one of them uh, at a cafeteria and um, then I was like, hey, can I like, you know, work with you over the summer? And he was like, uh, maybe, maybe not. Like, we'll see, you know, why don't you show up on this day and like, we'll figure it out. 
Um, and then I showed up and he had a project for me and then um, I really had liked the research. So um, I feel like the superconducting qubits world is like a good, great combination between like physics, computer science and electrical engineering. And I think I like I was interested in all three of them and it was good to like not like choose or like, you know, pick sides and like a made, you know, a uh, thing to focus on. I was like able to uh, work in that intersection. Um, so, yeah, I've been working on it. I, I like I. I was very lucky to like, um, you know, uh, really like the first thing I tried to do. And I um, have been working on it for like four years now um, and maybe a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I, I think this can all, but then I think there's a lot of value in like trying different things as well. Um, I feel like, you know, you gain a lot of experience and knowledge and stuff, you know, maybe bouncing around fields and I, um, a lot of, uh, uh, but I think a lot of the really good ideas in science also come from uh, in applying uh, ideas from a different field in like, you know, your current field. And um, this is something I guess I don't not have much experience with. So I'm like trying to learn, uh, you know, how it's like to do quantum computing in different platforms now um, in graduate school. So um, both paths are like, you know, have a lot of value. But yeah, and for me, it was a very much an incremental journey towards you know, my final dissertation topic. So I started grad school. You know, at that point, I kind of knew I wanted to do uh, quantum computing, quantum information, and I converged onto experimental quantum computing, quantum information. Now, the reason why I chose to join a superconducting lab, uh, besides the fact that I liked the professor a lot, of course, was that um, no, in my mind, I thought that superconducting qubits is a very nice uh, you know, qu experimental quantum platform that's mature enough, that's developed enough such that we can actually use it to do useful stuff, to do quantum information experiments, proper quantum information experiments. Now, when I started grad school, I thought I'd be doing, you know, running quantum algorithms, working on like high fidelity two qubit gates, things of that nature. Um, but basically, you know, through the twists and turns of grad school, I kind of learned about many body quantum simulation, especially with you know, different quantum computing platform, including superconducting qubits. And, you know, that made a couple of parts of my brain happy. You know, first of all, I come from a physics background and there's a lot of physics in that. Um, and also another thing is that the reason why I like quantum computing in the first place was that it's a very practical field. You take, you know, quantum mechanics, which is this counterintuitive, weird, science and you do something useful with it. And as it turns out, you know, quantum simulation is very likely the first application where we can get quantum advantage using a quantum device. And I think, you know, having that power to do something useful or you know, at least like march towards doing something useful with the devices that we have available today, kind of, you know, check that last box for me is such that I converge onto this project. And I can tell you guys, I started on this project like, um, a couple of weeks into my second year of grad school. And then it's a project that I stuck with since. I had a couple of projects before I you know, worked on something else the summer before, and then like one project in parallel. But um, at the end of the day, the nice thing with grad school is I you know you can, you can like experiment and test with like, you know, test a couple of different projects and see what you like the best. That's really cool. So can I ask, you said that, you know, one of the reasons that you ended up where you are is because you uh, really liked the principal investigator that you met. Um, like, you know, could you add a little bit of detail to that? Like, what what was it about them that uh, that you really liked that really drew you to them? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, and actually, I think this is a very good thing to keep in mind for the folks who are interested in going to grad school or just starting grad school. Um, so a lot of the times, you know, um, as an undergrads going into grad school, the, the only thing that we pay attention to is, hey, like what's the, let's say the age index of this principal investigator? Like, you know, what's, you know, what, like how big is their name? And that's awesome. And again, like my PI definitely has the name, you know, has the reputation, has the scientific background. Uh, but another thing that's very important to keep in mind is, you know, um, they need to be a good person. And I can't emphasize that enough. So, and you know, a lot of the times you, know, you talk to other grad students, you can learn more information about the lab that you're joining that way. But also, first impressions go a long way. So, uh, in my case, you know, my my PI is you know, personality wise somewhat similar to me, and I got a very good impression from our first meeting. And again, throughout the years now, it's been five years. Um, I can tell you that, like, you know, I mean, he's a good human being. 
And plus, again, we, we match on a personality level, which is really nice. In addition to like, you know, I'm in science, but that goes without saying. So there, so again, like, you know, if I have to like, you know, give one advice off the bat in, you know, in, in your grad school process is, you know, listen to other grad students, you know, your PI and your lab sets your grad school experience. And you want to make sure um, that you're not just going based on your PI's name, but rather, you know, what environment you'll be a part of, because that can make a very big difference. Well, yeah, thanks for that, Anir. That was, I think, a really good perspective um, on your advisor. And I think a question I have, too, is beyond your research interest, how much did you know into graduate school about your research style coming in? And um, how did actually trying, like, the different research projects that you guys talked about, like, kind of help shape and uh, learn what style of research works best for you? Um, I'll open the floor to whoever wants to take it first. I think, um, so research style, I feel like I struggled with this a lot um, in my first year. I think I came in wanting to do experiment um, and I, I'd only done experiment. And I think um, uh, through the first year, I realized that like, you know, um, you know, maybe uh, I guess like I'm having more fun doing theory and like, uh, you know, it's this, I guess like I'm losing track of time and like, you know, I'm really, really invested when I'm doing theory and stuff. Whereas uh, when I'm doing experiment, I really enjoy myself, but not as much. Um, and uh, this can totally be different for anyone else. I think, you know, there's, uh, I feel like no um, sort of hierarchy at all. Um, but um, sort of, I, it took me like a few months to come to terms with that. And then also sort of discuss this with my advisors and uh, like, you know, um, establish that like, oh, maybe I'm going to do a theoretical PhD going forward. Um, and so I like, again, as Amir said, um, you know, having really good advisors is very, very helpful in that because you can be honest with them. You can sort of shape the nature of your PhD um, collectively. And uh, they were very, you know, uh, very, very willing and open to like, you know, having me sort of shape this uh, PhD and like sort of an experiment adjacent theoretical direction. Um, and um, they gave me a project which was on this uh, sort of um, in this area as well. And so, yeah, I think it's just like a collective effort you sort of realize with time. And I think it's also like pretty much very flexible in the first couple of years that like you're sort of figuring out your style and like no one expects you to sort of know how to do research coming in. Yeah, and I, I think, wanna, sorry, go ahead. Oh, Cody, sorry. Like, go. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, I'd say, yeah, I, I agree. Like, you know, it's hard to know, like, what, how you're going to do research coming into grad school. Um, I think for me, like, I also wanted to do experiment uh, coming in. Um, but I think I, I realized over time that, like, I kind of want to do, like, a little bit of theory, too, um, at least to, to have a better idea of, like, why these experiments are, are good, um, what direction the field should go in so yeah yeah and kind of to to supplement what was already mentioned i think one of the main points of grad school is for you to grow as a scientist and really you know start becoming a scientist because chances are everyone here has at least you know had some degree of experience with research you know whether small you know for a class project or larger like working in a lab in undergrad but what you learn very soon is that research in grad school is very different than research in undergrad. You know, as a grad student, you're you're doing research more independently, and I think as a result, you know, um, you go through basically a trial and error type exper experience where you know you find out what works for you, what doesn't, what gets you excited, and what doesn't. And again, hopefully by the time you know your grad school career is over, you have a really good idea of like you know your your identity as a scientist, and like again, what gets you ticking and how you work best. That's okay. That's really interesting. So I wanted to follow up. You've so you've described like um uh you know I mean Harsh, you said that your lab was really supportive of you know you sort of figuring this out that you prefer theory over experiment. Um, and, and Amir, I'm interested, you described sort of doing like different different projects as well. Do you feel like your lab was equally supportive? And like, how did you talk to your advisor about maybe being less interested in one project, being more in another, or, you know, like wanting to work on something different? Yeah, maybe I'll take a stab at it first. So, I mean, oh, actually, sorry, this, I, I, I meant to direct that question at you. Maybe I didn't say that. That's my yeah, bad. No, no, all good, all good. So I think 
Actually, so like, you know, the, this question that you uh, bring up and it ties back to the point that I made earlier. And I think this goes back to like, you know, who your advisor is as a person. So some labs, and again, there are quite a few of them out there uh, where, you know, once you're assigned to a project, that's it. You're stuck with it for the rest of your, you know, for the rest of your PhD, or at least the project is completed, regardless of what your interest is. And I think that because of that, it's very important to have to ask these questions of, you know, whichever lab you're joining ahead of time. Um, so, you know, in my case, again, my, my PI is very flexible when it comes to this. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of having a conversation. And again, chances are there will be resistance initially and for good reasons. You don't want to just jump from one project to the next to the next because that way you don't get anything done. But I think, you know, once you know for a fact that your interests have converged onto something, then that's when you go for it. Of course, in the meanwhile, you know, um, and in grad school, you'll get oppor an opportunity to lead projects. Chances are you will be leading one or two projects, but also you get the opportunity to help out and be involved with other projects. So I think, you know, in my case, you know, the first step towards like, you know, changing projects or like getting experience with other projects was just to help out someone else with their project. Plus, chances are you have a set of expertise as, you know, as a grad student with a slightly different background than your lab mates that can contribute to their project. So essentially, you can kill two birds with one stone that way. And hey, if you realize, you know, this is something that you're more passionate about than, you know, the project that you're leading, you know, then you can make that decision to kind of transition over into prioritizing, you know, that line of research more than what you're actively involved in right now. Yeah, thank you. These were really great responses. I think it's really good to know, um, you know, your guys' experience, I think, with getting to learn your research style and, like, um, valuable to hear, like, how to leave and join projects. Um, I think moving on to, like, something further that we hear a lot about in industry and people transit undergraduates going to industry is networking. But um, in academia, what's kind of your perception on how important networking and collaborating with your peers is, you um, I think in terms of also your lab and your school, but also like how you leverage the fact that you're in a PhD program to find specific opportunities within the quantum computing community. Um, and I think Cody, if you wanna be the one to start off this question. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think networking is like, is is like really key in grad school as well. Um, because at the end of the day, everyone is, is a human. Um, so if like, it's easier to work with people that you know. Um, so I think, you know, some of the ways that like networking has helped me is that like, you know, my lab is pretty much purely like ex experimental. So if I want to do a little bit of theory, I have to talk to, you know, other people. So, um, you know, I, through through networking, I was able to talk to Professor uh, Narong Nor and we're beginning some like new theory projects on silicon color centers as well. Um, so, yeah. I think um like like the uh, again uh, just uh, echoing what um was just said but then also adding that I guess um a great way to network or meet people and stuff is usually like conferences um so I went to my first big conference like uh, last March and uh you know like you get to meet so many people and it's very like people are happy to talk to you as well so you can attend talks and then after the talk if you like are really interested in that person's research and stuff you can always go up to them and if you give talks like people will come up to you as well a lot of times um and then you know uh I think um, like one of my uh, professors was like, oh, like we go to conferences just to meet people and just to like talk in the hallways and stuff like that's where the real science happens and not in the in the actual like presentation rooms and stuff. Uh, and uh, and then also, I guess, you know, if you're friendly with like a lot of the older students in your lab, they will introduce you to other people and they will, um, you know, help you make connections as well. And then as as time goes on, like sort of you keep that, you know, you keep those connections alive. You, uh, you know, say hi to each other at every conference and stuff. And then maybe you don't really have a project to work on right away. But then, you know, just getting to know the person uh, like two years down the line, you might have like something that you want to talk about. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, That's, I mean, I think, you know, there sorry. have been great points. Sorry, Michelle. Yeah, I just was going to say there have been like great, great points that have been touched on. Um, and in my experience, you know, networking, like doing great research is important. I mean, that's why you're a researcher. But I would say that networking is equally as important just because at the end of the day, you need to be able to communicate your research and kind of like take it one step further than just like a manuscript that you write or a talk that you give. 
but also when I like, you know, set forward a challenge for, you know, for those of you who are starting grad school or in general as, as scientists, and that is to go beyond just a superficial network, you know, try to get to know the people as people actually, rather than just like, hey, like this person knows a good science. Because in my experience, that goes a long way. I have like friends that I've met this way, you know, during my first conference in grad school that, you know, we still hang out, like if they come to Boston, if I go to their town or at, you know, the conferences that we see. And again, you know, who knows, we might collaborate in the future or not, but at least, you know, you can, you can make scientists friends. And I think, you know, that goes a long way. That's awesome. Uh, I mean, Cody, uh, you know, Harsh and Amir have both shared like conference experiences that have been impactful for them. Do you, do you have you had the chance to attend any conferences? Like, do you feel that you have been particular that have been particularly impactful in your development? Um, yeah, I think. Um, well, I I would say like I guess two things as an undergrad, maybe. I mean, this is maybe more relatable to you guys because like you guys are attending this conference together. Like you know, keep these con like keep these con like connections alive and like you know uh, make them very meaningful, as Amir was saying. Uh, for example, like as an undergrad, I attended this um like IBM uh, Kiskit hackathon type thing. Um, and um, you know, I met like one other person from that um who was also an undergrad and like we uh, were in the same year and stuff, and so we stayed in touch. We uh, you know when we were applying to grad schools and stuff we like sort of talked to each other we went to different universities um but then like i now i guess he works in the same lab that amir does so like when i was in boston so i sort of uh, caught up with him and then i got lunch with the whole lab and stuff so again you know um uh, through these conferences like or like you know people are in the same sort of boat that you're in sort of just uh, you know navigating that together can also help um but then, and then the other conference that I, the, was really me meaningful to me was the March meeting conference, which like is uh, very, I guess, uh, big in the physics community. And I know uh, it's the conference that everyone goes to if you're doing uh, physics. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think it's so wonderful that you guys kind of talked upon the friendship building aspect of conferences. I feel like it's not really a perspective you hear a lot, but I do feel like a lot of the, the peers and from what I've seen, um, in the lab that I've been <laughs> kind of sitting in on at UT is like, they'll go to conferences and they'll, like their, um, I think research peers on on papers have been people that they've met and, you know, have a similar interest. And so it feels like it opens up doors to future collaborations, not just like within your own school, but across multiple universities um, and connections that you can make for a lifetime further. Um, so that's really wonderful. And I think to pivot a little bit from the conference point, um, I think, a question on everybody's minds uh, for PhD is how do you manage the work-life balance between doing your research, um, starting off your first year in courses, and then I think, you know, getting involved in being a lead in projects and TAing. Um, is it, was it like a very rough change in comparison to being an undergrad, having TA positions, and then, you know, being a PhD student? Because it feels like you do have more flexibility, but also I think a big thing is like, oh, suddenly, there's no structure and I have to kind of like regulate myself to do that. So um, Harsh, if you want to start off with how that experience has been like for, <laughs> for you. Um, I guess I'm still figuring it out. So uh, I think uh, for me, um, I, 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 yeah, I, I feel like, you know, I've just, I guess I've learned this from older grad students as well. Like, you know, have having like a proper schedule and stuff saying that, you know, I think, um, this also helps with your research. I feel like um, the uh, answer to doing good research isn't that you're working on the research every day, but is that you're like setting um, a dedicated time and you're going to do really, really good research within that time. And then you're also going to take time off and like sort of, um, uh, so I say that like at 6.30, I'm going to leave the lab and like go to the gym and stuff or, uh, you know, uh, or like cook food for myself or like, um, like cook dinner and stuff. So I think having sort of um, building in some like breaks and some, uh, uh, I guess, self care of uh, uh, time or doesn't just help with, um, you know, taking a break, but then also helps with like making sure that the time that you set up, set aside for research is very meaningful and you're just focused on research, research during that time. Uh, Cody, if you want to go next, since you're also um, kind of more of the recent PhD students. Sure. Yeah. I think at first, yeah, it's definitely a very rough um, ad adjustment. Um, and I think having a support network, like, you know, your, your parents, your friends, um, just like talk to if 
like things get really stressful. Um, during your first few years is really, um, is 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 really nice to have. Um, I think another day, another thing too is um, like Hirsch is right. Like breaks are good, um, because good work, um, is like efficient work, right? And you can only get efficient work done if, like, like you don't feel too tired. You know, you, you get proper rest. Um, so, yeah, I think for me it's like you know every single Sunday I I don't do research so. I think that that's that's how that's how I do it. <laughs> I mean, speaking of just a quick follow up on that, uh, you know, I'm I'm uh, I end up pulling a lot of all nighters as an undergrad. Do you still do that? Have to do that a lot as a graduate student? Is that part of student life just permanently? Or uh, sorry, Cody. Oh uh, yeah, sure. Um, I think if um if, if like there's a deadline the next day, then yeah, I I'll, I'll pull the all nighter. But otherwise, I I avoid it. I get try to get eight hours of sleep. <laughs> And um, uh, so maybe like on a similar note, um, so what like when you were transitioning from, you know, like Michelle said, sort of this really structured undergraduate life to graduate school, um, was there one thing that you felt like was, you know, a big challenge? Like what, you know, what what sort of was your like biggest challenge in adjusting to, to life as a graduate student? Mm, I think it's like, um like your timetable is very different than that of like friends you might meet or friends that you might have um because like, you know a lot of people they work like nine to fives after they graduate college versus phd schedule is a little bit different than that um so i think readjusting your expectations on what your re relationships might look like um I, th I think that was the biggest challenge I think uh, the other thing is that it's like very much a mindset shift, like doing uh, research is really different from uh, doing like prom sets for your classes and stuff. And I think as an early grad student, you have to do both. And it's, uh, you know, you have to take classes and also do research on the side. And I think a lot of times it's easy to fall into this comfort zone of just like focusing a lot of time on your classes because you've done that for like basically your whole life, right? Like you're kind of, you kind of have figured out how to do prom sets or like study for like with through textbooks and stuff and like study for your classes. And um, it is really easy to fall back into that comfort zone and like not spend any time on research um, because research is like uncertain. You're like in like some sort of dark tunnel and you're like figuring yourself like, you know, way out. Like you don't even know if there's gonna be an answer at the end or like, you know, that there's gonna be an answer to like every problem set that you do. Um, you know, you have to like, like be uh, comfortable with that uncertainty and like, you know, I guess uh, shift, like, you know, I guess, uh, moving out of your like, prom set classes comfort zone and going into this like sort of uh, research space um, is like a mindset shift and maybe you can be a little more mindful of that uh, and put effort into that as well yeah and to oh. piggyback oh okay i guess sorry michelle but to piggyback off of that point um i feel like this and something that i've heard a lot from a lot of grad students and i have experienced myself is that there's there's going to be some point during your phd they're gonna hit rock bottom in one one way or another. Because you know, you're too far, you're too far in, but also the end seems very far out. And you know, again, with research, it's uncertain. Things don't work oftentimes because if they were easy, it wouldn't be research, right? It would be in well, I shouldn't say engineering, but it would be something that like you know, you wouldn't get a PhD in. Just and like you know, for for folks who are going to grad school, just know that everyone's going through the same thing and you're not going through it alone. You know, things might get dark sometimes, but you'll you'll get through it and it's common. And again, it's just by the virtue of the fact that, you know, you're traversing in a jungle of unknowns, trying to find a path, you know, out. And you will, you know, a lot of those people, a lot of my friends and myself have gone through the same journey. I've ended up with a PhD at the end and are now scientists. So it's normal. Wow. Okay. And so, you know, I, I'm assuming you're speaking, I'm probably reasonably assuming you're speaking from experience. I mean, when, you know, when you hit that low point, like, like, what do you do? You know, what, what, what turns you around? Like what gives you sort of the inspiration to get out of that? Yeah. So I think in my case, one thing that I noticed helped me a lot is again, kind of really going back to the basics, like realizing, Hey, why you're in it, what makes you excited and taking it one step at a time. Because a PhD, right, is a long journey. It's a five, six year long journey. So if you try to look at it as a whole, 
it's quite terrifying, and especially when you're halfway in, right? When you're done with classes and it's just research, you know, still looking at three years of research ahead of you, that's a tall task. So just remember why you're in it, why you're enjoying it and take it one day at a time. And that reduces the event, in my case, and I've talked to some friends, I mean, a lot of friends who've gone through the similar experience, that reduces the anxiety that's, you know, caused by this, again, just unknown that you're traversing for the first time in your life, pretty much, and like helps you get through it, you know, more easily. Yeah, I think these are all very honest and kind of true experiences that I've heard resonate with like a lot of grad students. Um, <clears throat> I think one interesting thing that I wanted to ask is when we were talking about, you know, carving out time for research and then personal time um, and the transition for what like doing problem sets from undergrad looks like, because we have kind of structure for what defines like progress in terms of work. Um, has your definition of like what work in the context of research changed as you've started doing your PhD? Because even I feel like there are days when you do, you know, carve out towards your research, but then like what does that research actually look like day to day? Because it can be anything from, I think in my experience, like you're just trying to figure out what something means because you've never seen this one aspect before, right? And you haven't really made any tangible progress, right? But like you have built upon like your intuition and knowledge. And so how do you manage like that relationship between when you've started doing something new that you haven't really seen before in your research and still um, have it shape your definition that like, hey, I am making progress on my research or <laughs> um, Harsh, if you want to start with that. Uh, yeah, I think um, as a younger student, maybe, um, I feel like it is a little easier because a like I'm sort of, I guess I'm, I'm not working on a project that was I, like, I'm not working on a project that I came up with. I this project was, has been thought of by like an older grad student and I sort of have a mentor around um, there's like postdocs and stuff that I can like turn my chair around and ask like hey you know um, I don't know about so and so can you like guide me to some review articles or like papers and stuff which discuss this um, and uh, you know a lot of them have like uh, you know a vast amount of knowledge and stuff and they, they, they're they very very helpful um, so maybe as a younger grad student there are like a lot of resources from like a lot of older people that sort of help you out in some ways um, I guess I'm only beginning to start with this experience of like thinking about my own project and like you know charting my own direction for grad school so um, I don't know we'll see how that goes and Cody if you want to add on to that I'm sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> um, just like, I think what what progress or work kind of means to you in the context of research. And I think my comparison was like, you know, we have problem sets in undergraduate school where we have like measurable metrics for progress, but like in a day-to-day, -day, like how doing research may have shaped your definition of what progress actually is. Mm, yeah, I think... Um, I learned this year is to count no results as progress as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because when you're doing experiment, a lot of times you do the measurement and you're like, huh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, oh, wait, I think I messed up. And like that, that that's progress too. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, being able to, to like learn from, from your mistakes and count that as progress is, is, um, is, uh, is good too. And Amir, do you want to add on anything at the end? <laughs> Yeah, sure. So I think, uh, you no, know, a PhD is a very nonlinear process. It's like, you know, you might put in a lot of time and you might not see, you know, tangible, at least what you would call results. But again, even, even then you're, you're still making progress because that's a part of the journey. You know, it could be just spending a day thinking about something totally random, but at the end of the day, you know, yeah, you got to be creative as a PhD student. And, you know, this playfulness, this exploring is a part of the creative process. And again, you know, as an experimentalist, as Cody mentioned, like on an average day, things don't work, chances are. And that's fine because like, you know, that's a day that you've spent towards making them work. It, so it's, it's hard to get a notion of what progress is, but I think you'll get comfortable with the fact that, hey, you know, this is a part of the process. At, at least, you know, the later you get towards your PhD, I feel like, you know, like during my first two, three years, even like, you know, no tangible progress made me very uncomfortable. But now I know, hey, it's fine. Like, you know, I played with this thing. It didn't work. That's a part of the process. Wow. And so 
just a quick follow-up to that like you know if at that point where you're like you know not feeling like you're maybe not making any you said it's like really non-linear if you're at a point where you're not making a lot of quantifiable pro like progress is there any time where that really scared you or you're like oh is this going to work out yeah i mean chances are that overlaps with the low point that i was talking about like your thing just doesn't work you're not getting anywhere and you're like you're trying you're working uh, again it's just about getting comfortable with with that and, you know, doing what you're doing. And again, going back to the basics of like, hey, why am I interested in this in the first place? And again, I've, you know, it's not just my experience. I've seen many of my lab mates, you know, younger, older go through this. And I can tell you, you know, at the end of the day, like it usually works out. Not always, but very, like mo most often it does. Wow, yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> oh, sorry, Michelle, do you mind if I ask one more thing? Oh, yeah, go for it. Yeah. So, so I, I wanted to kind of, this is something that I, that I think is related to that, you know, as an undergraduate, like, uh, you know, just a few years ago, I was a high schooler and a lot of times I sort of realized that I, you know, like how little I know. And I feel the sense of like imposter syndrome, like, oh, you know, oh my God, wait, what am I doing here? People are expecting me to know things about physics and I, I actually don't know anything. Um, like, is that, does that continue to be part of your experience or has it been part of your experience as a graduate student? And like, what did you, what did you do to overcome that? Um, Cody, uh, do you, do you want to take this first? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, I spent like a good part of my first year just not feeling very useful because um, like the first few months I was literally just watching the older PhD students just do their experiments because I, I was just like okay cool I'm, I, I'm watching you al align this laser for like two weeks now and then I'm watching you like uh, how to the steps to you know cool down the cryostat and like all this stuff right I'm watching you make samples for an entire month and, and, then, I, and then I finally get to touch stuff um, so I, I think like the the feeling of imposter syndrome, I've also talked to older grad students and they're like, yeah, it, have, it stays throughout your PhD, but um, you just have to like tell yourself that, hey, like I, I'm, I'm here for a reason, like I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing, so yeah. Yeah, I think of very much the same thing. It's like, I think, you know, it keeps on going. Like, I feel like I have like an ever, um, like, uh, you know, everly, uh, I guess like uh, extending, uh, you know, range of like list of papers that I should be reading uh you know and it keeps on growing and like uh I try very hard to like you know tick some of those off and like you know one like sometimes I like I'm like okay cool I'm gonna read like you know a bunch of papers today and I like read up like five or so papers and then the very next day someone mentions something that I've never heard about and I'm like oh what, what did I just like what, what would I spend my time doing you know uh I guess so yes it keeps on like I guess the imposter syndrome uh thing like you know it, it keep it keeps well I guess uh, stays with you but then um you know as Amir was saying like you just, I think you sort of think about the big picture and stuff like you're like on this journey and stuff and it's like you know you're gonna keep on learning and like you think about what motivates you and like then you know you find out more and then you read more and stuff but then, yeah um I think uh, yeah so yeah I think the situation is you know one of the more you learn the less you know um so again, as someone who just got their PhD also, there is a bit of that imposter syndrome. But I think now the reason why is slightly different than like the imposter syndrome that I had freshman year of college. Now, you know, now I know how much I don't know and I'm very aware of it. And it, that's good because it motivates me to learn more. Like, you know, it, it keeps me on my toes and like, you know, will not will help me not get stagnant. But also at the same, same time, you know, like there is that uncomfortable feeling of not knowing. And, you know, that comes with the territory of science. But again, being aware of it, I think, you know, will help you kind of adjust for it as opposed to, uh, you know, being stressed out or uh, debilitated by it. Yeah, I think, <laughs> thank you. I think this is like a pretty, one thing that really made me feel more comfortable is that like when you're kind of going through like that very low point, you always kind of feel like you're the only one experiencing that imposter syndrome and everybody else is, doing great but like the reality is is I think um it's a pretty like commonality that it's very hard to measure like you know the progress you're making what you're doing and that like looking at it rather like a journey that everybody's on and it's individual like to you and like you're coming in from like a different background and like the things that you know are very different from like when someone else might know but um yeah, I think <laughs> I think in a in a way it's like comforting to hear that everybody kind of experiences this thing and it's 
I think unfortunate we all think that about ourselves, but um, it just seems to be like a pretty common point of like the PhD process. But it's I think it's really good to to understand like I think uh, what you said at the end of Mayor Lake. It just shows you how much like you can spend your whole life learning, but like the reality is there's so much that you don't know. And like the point of it is that like it gives you the curiosity and like the skill set to kind of pursue and tackle on those things for the rest of your life. Um, and that's kind of, I think, the the encompassing purpose around like wanting to to do more research and like kind of push the boundaries of like a field is that you have to be comfortable really not knowing something um, and taking on the challenge of, hey, like I'm going to be starting from scratch or my own experience and um, applying it in the best way that I can. Um, but with that, I think. Uh, here, so uh, before, before we transition to audience questions. Uh, so yeah, do you mind if I think to, I think to wrap this up, uh, I think a great way would be to ask, you know, uh, what's next for you, you know, like, and, and obviously this question goes to Amir first, since this is, uh, this is really, a, this is a reality for you, you know, like, I mean, what what is what is your plan for after your PhD? Where do you where do you plan it? Where do you want this to take you? Yeah, so I'm hoping to continue in quantum computing. And uh, even before I started my PhD, I knew I didn't want to go to academia. But luckily, there are a lot of good positions available in industry now as research scientists, where you get to build quantum computers. So that's a path that I'm interested in going down. Now the details are still being hashed out, but uh, hopefully, I'll find out in the next like month or two. What about you, Harsh? Um, I guess uh, I'm gonna keep doing my PhD. Uh, well, that's the short answer. The long answer is, um, well, I think um, I'm at a spot right now where we have like you know pretty good results, and like I think we're like maybe a month away from like big you know writing out a paper and like you know putting everything together. Um, so I'm kind of very pretty happy that like you know this like first project has turned out well. Um. Uh, but then I think I'm going to also spend the summer uh, doing a lot of reading and like sort of, I guess, like, you know, um, again, like, you know, this like, you know, making some progress towards like uh, this imposter syndrome of like, you know, I guess, you know, nailing down these fundamentals and like actually reading a lot of papers, you know, um, reading. Uh, it, uh, I feel like the sort of pressure of publishing my first paper has like somewhat subdued. So the summer is going to be mostly uh, uh, thinking about what to do next as well. And like also wrapping up this paper that we have. Um, but yeah, um, I, the question of like what to do after the PhD, I really um I could not answer. I feel like I go back and forth between like academia and industry like uh fairly frequently. And so uh yeah, I'm not sure. I still have like at least three or so years to go. So we'll find out soon. But yeah. Yeah, I guess for me, yeah, it's I mean continue my PhD, continue working on silicon color centers. Um but but yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I guess like the team that I, I work on have also gotten some nice results for that lately. So um, hopefully we'll be able to upload something to archive soon. But um, yeah, I think after the PhD, I'm actually hoping to go into academia. Um, uh, it, it's just because like, well, I, I, I joke that it's because I haven't lost all hope in grad school yet, but <laughs> it's um, like, it, it's mostly because I think, you know, I, I, I enjoy teaching, you know, I, I enjoy doing research. And I think in academia, you have a bit more freedom to decide which research projects you work on versus in, in, in like industry, what I've heard is that, you know, you like Google wants you to work on super uh, conducting qubits and like, that's it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and thank you guys so much for all the answers and I think the input. I, I would say like everybody here that participated learned a lot for this panel and I'm really happy with them. Um, just I think all the insight that you guys gave for our undergraduate audience and I hope that people today like walk away like having a better perspective of what a PhD looks like. Um, so Ben and I actually I think don't have any more questions for you and we'd like to kind of pass off um, the remainder of I think the 13 minutes that we have to the audience um, and ask let our undergraduates ask um, I think whether you're watching from the YouTube live stream or if you're on the Zoom call with us um, this is your chance to kind of ask our panelists, um, any burning questions you might have about a PhD program or your own experience at the moment and considerations with grad school. Yeah, so feel free to just unmute yourself uh, or put your question in the chat if you don't wanna speak and we can ask it for you. I 
think we should have asked people to like put questions in the chat as the panel was going on. Maybe I, I did. I did. Oh, you no, did. It's, it's all right. Well, of course we have backups. I mean, there's a thousand so things. To ask. Um, they were just if, so engaged in the conversation. They forgot. As, yeah. As we, as we wait for, you know, for uh, people with their questions, I'd like to ask. So what's, uh, what is, what is the most like fun experience you've had with your research group? Um, Amir? Um, what type of fun are we talking? <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, you know, fun, fun that fun that's uh, um, uh, streaming on YouTube. I don't know. Yeah, yeah no, no. I mean, you know, I, I was kidding you about that. By the way, <laughs> I think I'm I'm very fortunate to be in a lab um, that you know we're all friends. It's more like a family, despite the fact that the lab is actually quite large. So, you know, we have our weekly kind of like outgoing to the MIT pub, the Muddy Charles. That's like something that like we do as a lab every week. Um, when the weather is nice, we go play Frisbee, Ultimate Frisbee and Killian Court, all the way to like, you know, going out to like, you know, concerts and clubs when we're, you know, either, I mean, just like a weekend or like, you know, we're out at a conference, let's say like, you know, March meeting, for example, this past year. Um and I think, you know, these are like kind of memories that, you know, I'll take on with me, you know, after my PhD. It's like, you know, all the fun times and fun things that we, we did as a group uh, with my lab that really, you know, helped me through, get through my PhD experience. I think um, it's a very good point. I feel like uh, like most of your friend group does, just becomes the people you do research with a lot of times, I think. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the really good memories for me is that we had like a barbecue at one of my co-advisors uh, houses and like he has a pool in his back backyard and so uh, we made like a human pyramid in the pool which was really fun uh, uh, yeah and like I think it was like um, three stories high or something like three people over each other and stuff in the pool and it was like I think it took like a lot of collective effort but it was good like sort of uh, fun team building exercise I mean no one forced us to do it it was just us who were like you know should we do it <laughs> And it was kind of fun um but yeah uh, and then uh, also like even the small things and stuff like sometimes we um get our advisor to go to boba with us and we like you know a bunch of us go to boba and stuff and that's kind of fun we just chat around and uh get to know them a little bit better so yeah yeah i think um yes having like lab dinners or grabbing lunch with a lot of other people in in the group um, or like just like memeing around in, in lab in a safe way sometimes <laughs> can be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, those are all really fun experiences. I think, yeah, the camaraderie is kind of what makes it memorable. Um, we actually do have some questions from the chat now. Um, so Skylar Chen is asking, how much math did you actually need in grad school? And Harsh, if you want to start off. Uh, I mean, as a theorist, I feel like, um, um, there is a fair bit, I think. Um, our advisor, like, uh, you know, encourages us to like prove every sort of a result that we kind of try to use. Um, but also, uh, it like I think it varies. Like, uh, I feel like um, there's a lot. Like, you know, you you could make your PhD very like coding heavy and stuff as well. Um, I the stuff I I guess worked on previously was like pretty material sciencey heavy. Um, so um, you need like a decent amount of math, but like maybe you need more knowledge about like materials or like uh, you know physics uh, and stuff. So I think it like it varies. Like just probably depends on uh, what you choose to do for your PhD. And again, there's no hierarchy um, in like this kind of research you do. Everyone has their own sort of niche. Oh, Cody, if you want to go next. Oh, yeah, sure. I think um, it really depends on yeah, what you want to do. Like, um, if all you really want to do is like, you know, if what you want to do like doesn't require as much math, then, you know, maybe the most you'll need is like, you know, linear algebra and like differential equations. But if you really want to like get into really complex, like let's say quantum error correction codes, maybe you might need to know like Lie algebra, group theory, like a lot harder math. Um, so yeah, it, it really just, just depends on like which which area you want to do. Like maybe you might need to know more like electrical engineering, right? If you work on like superconducting qubits or so, yeah, it just really just depends. 
and Amir? Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, someone who's in quantum information broadly, um, linear algebra is my, my best friend. So if you're interested in quantum computing, quantum information, and you want to take one math class and only one math class in, in undergrad, first of all, try to take more. But <laughs> if not, take linear algebra. Yeah, awesome. I, and I, uh, we, we've got one more question from, oh, sorry, Michelle, were you going to say something else? Oh, just, just I recommend linear algebra for anybody interested in quantum. <laughs> um, but yeah, we did have one more question from the chat. Um, and I think I forgot that we didn't touch on this, but pretty important question. Um, Naz is asking, how stressful was the application process for looking at PhD programs? And Harsh, if you want to start off. Um, okay, sure. Um, I guess... Um, it is pretty stressful, especially because you're like, if you're applying straight out of undergrad, you're doing classes and stuff at the same time. Uh, and, um, but then I think maybe just remind yourself that like, uh, like a lot of this is like arbitrary and stuff. A lot of times, like I've seen, you know, pretty good people, uh, you know, just like miss out on like graduate school applications, because like, there's so many variables other than the fact that you like, you're a good candidate, like, you know, sometimes the advisor just doesn't have space or, you know, uh, like funding is an issue or something, or like, you know, maybe that department isn't taking grad students that year or something. So uh, just remind yourself that like, it, like you getting in or not getting in doesn't really reflect on how good of a student you are. Um, and then also sort of having a couple of friends who are doing it with you, it also sort of relieves that a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, I, I'm, and again, uh, get good recommendations, uh, you know, try to do research, try to uh, be able to present your research. Uh, again, I think you'll be fine. Uh, Cody. Yeah, it, I think I think it's pretty stressful um, because it's like you you kind of just like cold emailing a lot of people a lot of the times um, or like a lot of these applications. It's like you know you have to write like the, these essays and you have to like you know you you like on like what you want to do who you want to work with like and like really advertise yourself, which which can be stressful. Um, and then you have to ask like you know professors about as a rec um yeah but i i think um like yeah having friends that were, were all like doing it alongside me really did help um yeah um amir do you have any thoughts about uh stress i know it's it was it was probably it's been a while for you uh hey i'm not i'm not that old then uh no it was it would have <laughs> been like yeah five and a half years for me uh no i mean i, I just want to second what um cody and harsh said and just as a word of advice, especially for folks who are intending on applying to grad school, start on those personal statements early. Do it over the summer. Because A, you can iterate on them a couple more times during the year. And also chances are when your classes start, you'll get busy. I started during the summer and even then, probably like grad apps, you know, cost me a couple of all-nighters uh, my uh, senior, senior fall. So start early because, you know, you, chances are you know most of the things you're going to write, so don't procrastinate. Plus, you have chat GPT nowadays, which I didn't when I applied to grad schools. Oh, uh, I would add, like to add that, like, on the personal statement stuff, like, you get a lot of feedback from, like, grad students or postdocs and stuff. Like, I think um, I wrote my first draft, and I thought it was okay, and I sent it up to, like, uh, four or five grad students and postdocs and stuff, and they had, like, a ton of comments. Like, the, like they were, they highlighted basically the whole thing, and I had to, like, sort of change the whole thing and stuff, and that happened, like, for five or six times. Uh, so, you know, get a lot of feedback from, like, uh, uh, people who are doing PhDs or have already finished their PhDs and stuff. Uh, I think it really helps. Yeah, to second that, I've been on both sides of the story, you know, writing it and then giving feedback on like my, my undergrad mentees statements. Uh, your writing as an undergrad, your scientific writing as an undergrad is not great. And let me tell you, mine wasn't either. Like I went back and read my very first draft of my personal statement. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> uh, so yeah, feedback, iterate, you know, make it well, use all the resources I have at your disposal to, uh, to be able to, you know, draft a statement that reflects, you know, how amazing you are. Because again, like, you know, you all have done amazing work. You're all amazing students. You, you want to get, make sure that you're getting that across. So start early. That's I would I would like to emphasize that one more time. 
Yeah, I, I cannot recommend this advice more. Um, I will say, I think I had a very different perspective than like a lot of you guys, like with thoughts about starting a PhD, because it was only my last experience in my junior year um, at a company I really loved that was like, wow, maybe I should actually try to do a PhD. And so I started writing applications, I think the semester of, um, and like going through the process of, you know, finding someone to edit it, like, you know, going to cold email professors, like even kind of like actually thinking about like, what do I want to do for the next five years? Potentially it was like a pretty, pretty big question. And I think to figure that out, like all the semester, it was, it was a lot of stress. So start early, definitely. Um, I think so it is 128 now and um, student presentations are going to be starting again soon at 2.30. Is that, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, we have our, our, our uh, second session of student presentations that are starting in two months, so yes, sorry, we, need, uh, we should probably start wrapping up, but uh, but yeah, I I, I want to, yeah, thank all of you so much. This has been an incredibly good experience. I've gotten a lot of my questions answered um, about, and a lot of my fears assuaged about graduate school, so I really appreciate your time, really appreciate you being here and contributing to this event. Um, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I didn't want to cut you off, Michelle. No, you're fine. I was just going to get to conclusions anyway, but um, just as Ben said, like, we really want to thank you guys for um, participating in this, like, graduate panel for the SQUID conference. Uh, this is the first kind of event that we've done of its kind for undergraduate research, and I really hope everybody here got, like, a very good perspective on what a PhD program actually looks like for people that are very recently going through it, like Cody and Harsh, and then Amir, a seasoned expert, and <laughs> completing his PhD program. And again, congratulations on that, and thank you all so much for being part of our graduate student panel. Um, and for the audience, if you, I think there's a different Zoom link, but um, stick around on the YouTube live and we're going to start our next round of undergraduate presentations. So thank you so much for being here and have a great day, guys. Yes, thank you again.